So thank you everyone for, for coming here. And uh, my name's Purin Desai. I'm co-founder of uh, Bioregional. Um, here with my wife, uh, Sue here, who's also my fellow co-founder. Um, and as a, uh, uh, we were scholar awardees in 2009. So uh, uh, we've been coming here for a number of years and uh, it's always fantastic to be here and uh, learn so much from all the people who come here with all their experience, all their wisdom. Um, uh, uh, that, that you have to bring. Um, before we start, I'd, I'd just like to say a couple of things. First of all, um, please can you switch your mobile phones off if any of you have got mobile phones. Um, and we're going to do this as a very interactive uh, um, session. Uh, so we're going to have short presentations, but most of this is going to be done um, around a discussion where you have a chance to, to share, your, um, uh, share the issues you think that we face uh, in urbanisation, also solutions, and at the end we'll try and uh, uh, pull that together and see if there's some common ground. And um, of course, the theme of this conference is fault lines, uh, so we'll see where those fault lines might lie, and then how we might create the common ground, um, uh, which which will help mitigate um, uh, any of those challenges into the future. Um, uh, so, uh, I've also been asked to remind you that at the end of the session. Uh, we'd like you to fill in a survey form, so please do fill that in before you go and, and I'll remind you. And As we do the conversation, um, uh, we'll pass around mi uh, a microphone, so you can, if you'd introduce yourself and, uh, um, and use the microphone. Um, but we're going to start, um, you know, with our uh, panellists here, and we've got a fantastic set of panellists, uh, uh, Christian, Liz and uh, Sheila here. Um, uh, and so I'm going to ask, first of all, Christian to, to come up and just say a few words about uh, um, who he is, the organisation, and a couple of examples where he thinks there are going to be challenges and a couple of answers, uh, you know, a couple of ideas to start us off of where uh, the solutions might lie. So, uh, Christian, may I hand over to you? Sure, thanks. Um, uh, well, thanks, I think, uh, for, for everyone to come to listen to us. I think um, it, my, uh, everything I'll say uh, today in this panel uh, will not make sense if I don't give a little bit background about my, my journey uh, to care about these, these issues that, that we're advancing. My, my journey uh, as an architect, um, uh, right now I'm an architect uh, practicing in Kigali, Rwanda. If you don't know what that is, uh, it's a small country of about 26,000 uh, square kilometers. Uh, about the same size as Maryland, for people who are familiar with the US, so it's really small. Um, it's the most densely, fastest growing country on the continent, um, so that comes with a myriad of challenges. Um, but it's also the greatest country on this planet, according to me, so um, it's, a, it's, a, it's not all bad. But my beginning as an architect started in this city, um, uh, uh, Shanghai, China. Uh, that's where I went to school, architecture school. Um, Reason being that uh, at that time there was no school of architecture in my country when I wanted to go to architecture school. Um, so I went to Shanghai, uh, so I had the, the benefit of uh, studying architecture in this great city. Uh, it was my first experience with uh, a big urban environment um, as a student. I enjoyed it very much, uh, though my courses was in Chinese, so that was a hiccup, but it was great. Um, so. Uh, when I started working back home in Rwanda, there was this narrative, uh, and, and I have to confess it's one of the reasons why I decided to leave Shanghai after school, say I'm going home, I feel like I'm going to be more useful there. Uh, because there was this narrative how Africa is the next big thing, it's the next uh, big opportunities for architects, for investors, for everybody. Um, so in my, in my work, we started looking at um, these statistics very closely. Uh, by 2050, it's projected that uh, Africa's population will be 2.5 billion people. Um, to give a perspective, that's about the current uh, population uh, of India and China combined. And it will be the first time in history where the urban population, more than, more than half uh, of, uh, of the population uh, of Africa will be living in cities. First time in history. <coughs> and we looked at those numbers and we, we started uh, wondering what infrastructure needs to support that additional population looks like. Um, 
These numbers that I'm going to show do not account for the current shortage uh, in, in any of them. We basically looked at that additional population number uh, and looked at uh, common statistics about uh, family sizes and uh, catchment areas for certain uh, 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 civic infrastructure, and then we extrapolated numbers. Uh, so it's not exact statistics, but they're still scary. Uh, because we're talking about more than 700 million more housing units, um, about 310,000 uh, additional schools, and about 85,000 health clinics. That's assuming our current system stays the, the, the way it is. So in our, uh, in our thinking about the built environment and our practice, we, 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 something came clear to us that based on other conversation going on about climate change, about uh, protection of the environment, about socioeconomic uh, uh, conditions uh, uh, that are becoming more and more challenging, especially in urban areas, that how we set up all this infrastructure has to be carefully thought. Like it can't not be a, a, a random thing that we do in the same way we've been doing it for 100 years. Like we have to seriously think about how we do this. Uh, and that, that's, uh, that's the bottom line. Because um, the simple truth is that uh, if we don't, um, the current situation where economic inequality is blatantly uh, visible in our built environment uh, is going to worsen and, and, and reach uh, dangerous levels. Um, uh, early this morning, there was a panel that was talking about, about, about uh, how easily epidemics become pandemics because no one is paying attention. Uh, and, and we think that the infrastructure that does not uh, allow uh, he uh, healthcare professionals to, to be able to contain those epidemics, then it's going to be part of the problem uh, rather than being part of the solution. Uh, and all of these are things that, 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 that we, 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 every initiative we've done is trying to address. Um, um, so, in our, in our work, we strongly believe that, that if we curate, if we curate the, the design and construction process from uh, our point of view as architects, we're able to curb uh, 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 hindrances to eco economic inequality, to gender balance, uh, to protecting the environment. And, and because the built environment is a physical manifestation of underlying systems of our society, we should be able to change those systems or strengthen them uh, because we can't, we, our work cannot be neutral. If it, doesn't, if it doesn't help, it's going to hurt and it's going to hurt bad. And it doesn't roll back easily. It costs a lot of time and resources to roll it back. So we have to be careful during the planning process because if we don't, we do more and more damage to, 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 to our societies and the environment and, 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 uh, and so on. Uh, so that's what uh, uh, I want to start with. Uh, uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions that arise from that. Yeah. So, so, so thanks, Christian, and, and, and we'll open it up uh, after we've had the presentations. But so, so one thing struck you about uh, your design, it's not neutral. <laughs> uh, you have the opportunity to design infrastructure to help um, or to hinder the outcomes we want. So one interesting thing was I can see just from my own experience how uh, economic inequality can be addressed through planning, and we can discuss that later. But interestingly, you said gender inequalities can be addressed Correct. through planning. How, 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 how do you see that coming through? Yeah, so uh, we, we happen to, to work in a field that has been predominantly uh, associated with men. Uh, and and it, it also happens to be one of the areas uh, where this economic boom on the continent is going to be um, to be based. Uh, the, the investment in infrastructure development uh, is, uh, is outpassing anything else, any other investment that we think is going to happen in the continent in the next 35 years. Um, and there, there is a number of organizations that have shown that, that, that income, in a, sorry, income that goes into the, the hands of the mothers of the families end up being used for education, for health, uh, and, and, and food on the table. And we see that uh, as a if we as architects and, de and designers can own that decision to say that on, on our projects uh, uh, we insist that, that the gender uh, equality is reflected, not only in how our spaces are designed to, 
to, to, to not segregate uh, or, or, or support this, um, uh, this gender inequality uh, um, status that exists already, uh, but also make sure that uh, all of that process, there is equal participation uh, of women in, into, into, into it, then we're, we're, uh, we're part of the solution to yeah, make so, that gender so, balance. So, so using these infrastructure projects as an opportunity for economic empowerment of women, but also getting their wisdom in, in how that's designed. Exactly, so, yeah, exactly. So, so good, great, Thank, thanks for kicking us off uh, with that, Christian. And then I'm just going to ask Sheila here to share her thoughts in a few minutes. Uh, <coughs> thank you. Um, I think it's always a good thing to start off with uh, with your own and story. You introduce yourself as yeah. Well. So I'm Sheila Patel. My full-time day job is I run an NGO in Mumbai called Spark, which works with a social movement of the urban poor in India, which has 800,000 families residing in 70 cities and nine states. And so after you speak about Kigali and Rwanda, I'm speaking about the subcontinent in which whatever we do seems to be like a little speck. And so, uh, uh, so in 1996, eight uh, social movements or federations of informal settlements got together uh, because in the period between 1990 and 96, these countries came to India, looked at the way we were working, and followed this model. And so in a terminology that I see used here a lot, we became aggregators of informal settlements in city and national federations so that they could transform who they were, how they behaved, and how they addressed their own processes. And so while I run this NGO in India. I chair the board of uh, STI, which is uh, Shack Dwellers International, which today has 37 countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, where national federations seek to work with uh, multilateral, um, bilateral, national, municipal, private sector companies and people with a view to say, what are we going to do with cities that are broken today, that don't address these issues, and begin to acknowledge that the poor people who live in cities in informality are critical fighters of global inequality. So that's our goal. Our goal is to be treated as an important ingredient. And, uh, and when you look at the development stage, you realize that we are very, very far away from this. Uh, Everybody is still struggling to, to find depth and value in addressing the rural poverty challenge. Uh, the urban has been ignored for the last two centuries. And even today, uh, 2015 is two years ago, uh, we still do not have development discussions mm -hmm. that not only address the deficit of cities today, but anticipate what's going to happen in the next 20 years. So that's where we locate ourselves. And what we find is that with the, the real fault line, as is the conversation here today, the real fault line in cities is the difference between formal and informal. 18th and 19th and 20th century frameworks of city planning and regulation make everything that is informal, criminal, illegal, and unacceptable. And yet more and more poor people through migration, through refugees of nearby wars or riots and conflicts, are teeming into the city into what somebody described three years ago, uh, an English author called the arrival city. The slums, the informal settlements are the arrival city. And engineering, planning, architecture, social development are very far away from looking at the kinds of changes that are needed in order to accommodate and create equitable cities that work for all. We don't even acknowledge the ingredients that are necessary. So what we find is that the very concept of planning in cities is exclusive. 
It makes everybody who is poor invisible. And so when we look at the new challenges, and you'll be talking about them, about energy, about carbon footprint, about uh, resilience, climate change, all this is based on flawed data, which does not have present information about who the poor are, where they live, where they came back, what they can do, and what do you deal with the deficits, mm. or project the demographies of the future. And so if the data is flawed, then your plans are flawed, and the chances that you'll get anything, even in the next century, right, if you're all mm. able to leave such a legacy, seems dismal. So. In our parlance, we say that it takes three generations of people living in city to accomplish an identity. You know, cities are based on identity. You need, you need an identity, you need uh, papers, you need documentation to prove that you have a right to live in the city. And our experience is that people who migrated into the city so much as 60 to 80 years ago are just beginning to get acknowledged in the most rudimentary way of what cities and city establishments call recognized informal settlements. Mm -hmm. So you don't, there's no change to look at the land policy of how you get tenure, nothing. Deficits of water, sanitation, still very far away. And even today, just now as we speak, <coughs> there are at least 35 hotspots in our own federations where people are still fighting evictions. So where national governments should be aiding the poorest people to survive in the city, to ensure that the next generation gets health, education, all the things you're talking, people's very humble assets of their tin shacks are getting broken down. The legal system cannot help them because the legal system is based on development frameworks. So the law has to interpret the legal framework. It's very rare that you will get a judgment which goes outside the development framework. And so you have a situation where the law really doesn't work for poor people. And we're talking about SDGs where we're saying we want to leave no one behind. So you have this huge challenge of this development deficit. And you have a world in which cities really represent the crisis of the Gini coefficient where you have three to four percent people who own 95 percent of the assets. So you have this happening in the city. Uh, Jim Kim yesterday talked about the aspirational challenges. We have uh, all our countries in Asia and Africa, you have 60 percent people who are less than 35 years old. They all have smartphones. Some of them are recycled and resold, but they all have these things and they have seriously big aspirations. They are not like their migrant parents who are humble, grateful to be fed two times a day, ready to accept all the, the injustices. They will destroy your city if you don't take care of them. And this is a message that is going nowhere. Every so time I that. say this. Yeah. So, so do you have? Uh, so, so do, do you have solution. an example? Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, yeah. Do you have there. an example of a good? So, <laughs> but the reason I'm saying this is that even in this conference, we don't have enough discussions about our global future, which is urban. So, if we don't address this as a development challenge today, we're Having this conversation 30 years later is not going to give us anywhere. So I was mm. talking about that. So what are we, so let me start off with what we're doing. Mm. We've, we do several things. The first thing we do is we aggregate. Social movements are critical in areas where the law doesn't work for you. So the STI has a methodology by which it is a women-centered, but it involves men, women, and children in this social movement where you look at how individual needs and aspirations get collectivized and prioritized collectively so that they produce a voice 
that becomes difficult to ignore. When in Mumbai, for instance, we have a city of uh, 12 million people. We represent the bottom 10 percent. So we have 450,000 households in Mumbai living in informal settlements. And I just have to say I represent them and I get a voice. Not because I'm so smart, but if any of these people show what they can do in stopping the city, mm. it's serious business. And we've done it sometimes, not very often, but that's one. So, so, so we, aggregation. So, so aggregation. The second is data. No city has full good quality data about all the informal settlements that can be geotagged today's environment that tells you what the deficits are to form the basis of a robust development plan. So we have started doing this. Uh, we get lots of very smart IT people who say, oh, you people are so backward, you do everything manually. But when you work with poor people, you work with older poor people, you have to do everything manually, otherwise they don't believe you. So we, we, we develop this data, and we have a website called Know Your City, which is being populated with the data that we work with. The third thing we do is we say, let's create partnerships with people we have loved to hate in the past. Poor people hate their mayors. They hate their councillors, because they only come when they need a vote, but they don't come the rest of the time. So we're saying, how can we create partnerships and relationships with them in order to start developing this framework. The fourth thing we do is because we are now an international organization, we are making it politically incorrect to have global discussions where a slum dweller is not on your panel. Mm -hmm. And so in the last 20 years, we have that. We, we sit on many committees. We sit on any panels. But our challenges, which is what I'll start now, is that there needs to be more depth and more teeth to those partnerships. At the moment, it is more symbolic. Uh, uh, slum women who are on these panels, if any of you have been to Quito for the UN Habitat, you'll see every single panel had a slum dweller. 80% were women. And they made everybody laugh and cry. But I think we have to go deeper. So that's, Kila, let's go so deeper a bit later. Okay. So thank you. You've given us a very, a very good introduction to your organisation <laughs> and you. some fantastic examples. I mean, I love the uh, partnerships with people you used to hate, and I think I might have to take that away <laughs> and do <laughs> some you. work in my own life on that. Um, but thank you, Sheila. <laughs> I think we live in a world where we have to do that all around. Yeah. So great. Thanks. And, and, and uh, Liz, perhaps you can share, introduce yourself and share with us what your work is about and your ideas for... Uh, for the future. Certainly. I'm Liz Agbertabi. I'm excited to be here today. Sorry, my voice is a little bit scratchy. I'm uh, recovering from a cold, um, but I, wouldn't, I didn't want to miss this opportunity to share with you the work that uh, we're doing at 100 Resilient Cities. Um, so 100 RC is a, a $178 million commitment of the Rockefeller Foundation to work with 100 cities across the globe to build resilience to the challenges of rapid urbanization. And that's physical, social, and economic uh, challenges that all cities face and that all cities attempt to address, um, but in many ways are inefficient and have not been successful at addressing um, these challenges. So we define um, urban resilience um, as the capacity of individuals and communities, institutions, businesses, and, and systems within the city um, to survive, adapt, and grow in spite of whatever challenges that they may face. And these challenges could be acute shocks, um, which could be man-made um, or, <clears throat> or natural, um, whether it's an earthquake, a sandstorm, a blizzard, et cetera, or they could be chronic stresses, which many of our cities face around unemployment, uh, wealth and income uh, disparities, uh, uh, the lack of availability of affordable housing. So we know that cities across the globe face these challenges, and, and we know that um, these shocks and stresses are interconnected, and we feel solutions to these should be as well. Um, 
We see many cities that go around attempting to address uh, these challenges through a single entry point, and we've seen that they're largely um, ineffective. Um, and we also believe that solutions to these challenges, while they may emanate from the, the municipalities, um, but they need to be broader, more inclusive, and they, they need to engage uh, marginalized communities. So slum dwellers, for example, um, and low income uh, communities are, are communities that we believe should be informing uh, decision and making and policy and not be considered as an afterthought. Um, in uh, the work that um, I've done historically, um, I focus primarily on vulnerable populations and uh, inclusivity, and it's something that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, I um, am from Cameroon, a small country in West Africa, um, where I happen to be part of the minority group um, in, in my nation. And so um, dealing with uh, marginalization and exclusion is something that I've grown up with um, for, for most of my life, and so it's something that's really important. Um, so we organize um, resilience um, across a city resilience framework. Um, which allows us to identify um, the, the risk, the vulnerabilities, and the opportunities that cities may face and which cities must address to be able to develop resilience. Um, so what you see here uh, is our CRF, um, and it's really organized around four sort of do uh, domains around the people, the place, uh, the um, economics, uh, and <clears throat> the environment that cities need to develop um, and to be able to, to be more resilient. And, and, and the CRF is? The uh, city's resilience framework, okay. which was okay. developed by the Rockefeller Foundation in partnership uh, with Arab. Um, and so we believe that cities have to provide essential services and a sense of well-being uh, to their citizens. Cities have to provide economic opportunities. Um, cities have to provide um, the, uh, transportation and communication um, so that citizens feel a part um, of their cities. And what the CRF does is each of these um, drivers and their more sub-drivers um, can be used to grade a city's performance in providing these services um, for its citizens. I'm a nurse by training, and so I like to think about this as the immunity sort of uh, system for each of our cities. While a city may not be meeting um, the needs across any of the uh, sub-drivers, other subdrivers may uh, be amplified and may provide um, and confer immunity to the city, and so all um, interrelated. Um, I want to share with you a couple of examples of how uh, city planning um, can increase a sense of social cohesion and well-being in cities, and then I'll share with you some examples that have haven't done that. Um, and I'd like to talk to you about some of our member cities. Um, I'll first start off with uh, Medellin, uh, Colombia, which is one of our um, sister cities. Um, and many of you may know um, about Medellin uh, from the um, HBO series um, Narco, um, which has made that city quite popular. Um, but <clears throat> in, in 1988, Time Magazine called it the most dangerous city in the world. Um, and how Medellin became uh, the most dangerous city in the world is quite interesting um, because it's a microcosm of what we're seeing in many cities across the world today. Um, first off, like many cities, Medellin had a master plan in the African city, so I manage our portfolio of, excuse me, I manage our portfolio of African cities, so of the 100 <coughs> across the globe, we have 11 in Africa. And um, in many of our African cities, we're embarking upon master planning. It's the new buzzword. It's super sexy. <laughs> Every city that you go into wants to be the next Singapore in Africa. Some cities have done a really good job of, of uh, developing master plans, and some cities haven't quite grasped uh, the concept of master planning and what that can actually provide. 
Medellin had a master plan, um, which was developed in the 50s. Um, but what that city didn't account for was the rapid urbanization and the population growth um, that ensued. So Medellin went from being a city of 350,000 uh, people to over a million people by 1973. And so really this concept about thinking and planning for the city of the future and not the city of today was lost on uh, Medellin. Um, and of course, with rapid urbanization came economic upheaval. Um, and the idea of chronic stresses that we talked about earlier, all of those started to um, emerge. And they were huge in Medellin. Um, job growth was on the decline. Um, infrastructure uh, was failing, social services, city planning. Um, and the city just wasn't able to adapt and grow uh, fast <laughs> enough. And what this led to was, um, was margin further marginalization uh, for the bottom pyramid um, uh, citizens in Medellin. Um, it also led to um, a rapid growth of informality. Um, and so um, people were no longer able to afford to live in the city center. And so they went up into the hills and they, they uh, informal uh, communities uh, sprawled. And what that did is it created uh, geographic isolation away from the commercial hub. Um, it created abs um, desolate uh, communities. And then what happened was the drug cartels took um, advantage of this situation and they came in and they provided short term opportunities for many of these um, desolate um, uh, citizens. And um, in the 80s, um, <clears throat> at one point, the uh, Medellin cartel supplied 80% of the world's cocaine. Um, there were kidnappings and drug lords uh, were waging war from the hilltops. So remember, think about this, because the uh, residents could no longer live in the city center, they fled to the hilltops. This created geographic isolation. Um, and so um, there were about 6,000 6, uh, plus uh, people murdered um, in Medellin in 1991. So think about that. That's about 17 people a day. I lived and, and uh, studied in uh, Baltimore City, which has one of the highest uh, of, um, homicide rates in the United States. And just the thought of 17 murders a day um, is just so alarming. But that was the situation in Medellin. Um, and this city was in crisis. Um, and it didn't matter what the government did. Um, however earnest it was, uh, the progress was fleeting. So, Something transformational did occur um, in Medellin between 2002 and today, and, and you have to think about what happened. Um, so the homicide rate uh, decreased by 95%, um, and the poverty rate fell by 22%, and public school students were performing better, um, about 20, uh, um, and you have to wonder, and there were economic opportunities, and you have to wonder how this happened. What happened in Medellin is that while they focused on cracking down on the drug cartels, they increased the police force, um, but that wasn't really the root of their transformation. Um, what they also did was they created opportunities for inclusivity to get the voices of the citizens um, engaged in the planning and in the response, um, acknowledging that uh, their master plan was rather myopic. Um, and so citizens were, were engaged in a participatory uh, process, which went from planning and budgeting to implementation, um, et cetera. Businesses were also engaged. Uh, civil society um, was engaged, um, NGOs, and they forged a new plan. And, and this new plan really um, was based on looking at new approaches to addressing chronic existing challenges, um, and which focused on addressing not just the acute shocks, but also some of the chronic stresses that the city um, had, had been facing. And so what we saw in Medellin um, was that some pretty remarkable things came out. So remember the geographic isolation that people in the hills were facing. Um, they, they built gondolas um, to connect uh, these communities so people could now come into the city to seek opportunity, into the commercial base to seek opportunities. They were no longer geographically isolated. Um, they went to really poor um, neighborhoods and they, and they built libraries and they built parks um, where people could congregate and uh, feel a part of uh, the community. And, and they really focused on, uh, on public transportation to improve the urban mobility, which had been 
um, a, a challenge. And Medellin all of a sudden went from the most dangerous city in the world to a city that was actually fun to live, work, and play in. Um, and so what we saw in Medellin as, at the time is really what we're embracing, this concept of resilience planning. It's this concept of having a holistic approach, uh, a transversal, um, multifocal approach to urban planning, which is inclusive of some of the marginalized and forgotten um, populations. Yes, so <coughs> great. That's so a participatory approach to planning and budgeting uh, helped transform uh, Medellin there. So uh, great. Do, do, do you want to share one example where it went wrong <laughs> or, yes. or where it hasn't worked well? Yes. Uh, and, and then we can open it up to, to, to our... Uh, Absolutely. Our well, Kigali was a city where it actually worked, uh, that developed and is working, that has developed the master talk plan. About Kigali a we'll later. talk about Kigali a little bit later. Um, but the other city that I, I'd like to talk about is a city um, that I'm sure most of you know, the mega city in Africa, uh, 23 million, a population of uh, 23 million, um, and that's Lagos, um, which is more than Victoria Island which many people know. Um, but Lagos is a city where um, they are not embracing uh, this concept of participatory uh, planning. Um, it's a city that is uh, grappling with rapid urbanization as people um, migrate from other parts of Nigeria to seek economic opportunities. It's a city that um, desires to mimic Western cities. It's a, it's a city that um, desires to be sanitized and, and to look um, like a Singapore, um, for example. Um, it's a city um, that has a, a waterfront uh, that there's a desire um, to develop and uh, to redevelop. And as a result um, of uh, the uh, Lagos City government's um, des desires, what has happened recently is there have been a sort of a rolling and, and uh, revolving um, <clears throat> destruction of, of the homes of the uh, residents, uh, particularly That's targeting the targeting uh, the informal uh, settlements. Um, Atoro uh, Pame is one of the uh, settlements that just last month was de uh, destroyed. And so there have been um, forced, uh, there have been uh, uh, forced expulsions of uh, families and communities um, in Lagos. And what we see that when, when cities approach um, this desire to develop uh, in this way, um, what it does, it, it undermines the very drivers that we talked about earlier, creating this sense of cohesion, um, this sense of ownership and uh, belonging, well-being um, in communities. And so Lagos is a member of the 100 Resilient Cities Network. It's, um, I manage uh, the relationship uh, with uh, the government of mm -hmm. Lagos City, and so um, it's a very uh, tough relationship. But what we're doing is ensuring that umbrella organizations like uh, Slum Dwellers um, International are at the table and, and, and have a voice um, and are part of the decision and policy uh, making um, in Lagos. Fantastic, thanks Liz. Great example of a success and one which hopefully will be a success in, in a few years' time. Um, so, uh, so you've heard from our, 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 our panellists and some, uh, some great examples there. Uh, we'd like to open it up now to you and, um, and maybe to, this is a massive issue, urbanisation, rifts, uh, opportunities. Uh, so, so, so maybe we can just try and structure it a bit. I, I think in, in, in this first uh, part of this this discussion, maybe we can limit it to either questions for the panelists here or particular issues. So we'll come on to s possible <laughs> solutions later. But 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 let's stick with anything that struck you about what our panelists said. If you've got a question for one of our panelists, or if you have got you know where you think fault lines might arise um, in addition to the fault lines which have been uh, expressed by our panelists here um, in their presentation. So uh, would someone like to to kick off? So. Yeah, should we take, so, sorry, a hand over here, yeah, I need. Just behind you. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Hi, I'm Laurie Gehring from the Thompson Reuters Foundation. I, I do coverage about climate change um, in a lot of these places that you're talking about, and that feels like something that's creeping up to be really one of the hardest challenges as, as the cities urbanize and they face not only all the things you've talked about, but then more extreme weather and, and more problems with food access, water access, 
everything else. I'm just curious how much that's being taken into account, how how serious a problem you see that coming up. Yeah, would any, any one of our panelists Let's like to? Let's all the questions. Uh, do, uh, I, 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 I should give you <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's take the questions first. Sheila, you're very <laughs> helping me a lot here. Okay. So, 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 if you've got any questions, let's. So, first question is climate change, uh, and and uh, risks from that, and then. Thanks, uh, Liz. As a Colombian, um, I think there was uh, everything you said. I. I agree wholeheartedly with why Medellin is such an integrated and wonderful city in a lot of ways, but um, you can't forget there's some just life social changes that happen as well alongside and obviously um, the killing of, of Pablo Escobar and narco traffic, uh, you know, terrorism has played a huge role I think in, in the integration of that city because people start to trust each other a little bit more, uh, which is an important element. Um, I think my question of, of what was spoken about, um, something that goes often talked about um, in, in I, I'm working on personally, so I care about it a lot, is I'm, I'm interested in, in hearing from you all best practices on, um, on, on connectivity, specifically around high-speed internet and, and the important kind of, st not, not step changes, I mean huge uh, changes that, 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 that can bring a community in terms of offering hope, offering education, and, and, and really bringing down um, the cost of, of disseminating information and opportunity. Great, so um, best practice in connectivity. Uh, and, and a last one here for this, this round. Hi there, um, I'm Devin Rabello. I'm a current business student here at Said. My question is specifically on businesses. So there's a lot of conversation about bringing in the marginalized voices and a lot of pressure it seems on government, but I'm curious about the role of businesses coming to the table, particularly in hiring folks or what their engagement would be in um, how they structure their businesses to be more inclusive in infrastructure and how they're bringing money to the table to really um, propel uh, a bit more of the sustainability within these locations. So are you thinking about big businesses or small businesses? Or? A, a bit of both. I think it really, yeah, okay. it, it depends on what's actually showing up. I'm curious of what's happening right now. Okay, brilliant. So, 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 so let's take those uh, three questions. First of all, climate change. Anyone want to take thinking about how we address climate change, um, or examples, or yeah, that's that's a big one. And I think for for uh, in our work um, for climate change, I think we can't we can't stress enough how um, our decisions as architects and designers and planners uh, obviously uh, can can help offset some of, uh, let's say, uh, carbon emissions uh, in an instant. If, if you talk about the choice of the material used, if you took that into consideration, we can put a very uh, uh, um, measurable metric about how we're doing well. And, and I think uh, in the past, let's say, 20 years, uh, we architects have been uh, priding uh, getting pride in, in putting that number to our buildings. My building achieves X number of, 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 uh, 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 of, of carbon uh, offset, uh, whatever. But I think the, the, the biggest problem is, is relies in, in, in way, way beyond that we put that label on that building uh, or, or in, that, in that thing. Uh, and it has to do with what uh, Sheila was talking about, for instance. And we had this debate uh, at our office because we organized debate internally to talk about these things. Is uh, if it's a building that uh, is uh, lead or seed platinum certified, but it's a building that was built in a cleared former settlement um, that uh, took away uh, people's lands or everything, should we be engaged in that? Um, so we, the way we think about climate change in, 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 in our office is is. We don't want to isolate it as an issue we need to tackle for now. Um, like we, we, want to, we want to architects and the designers, especially the young ones on the continent, to understand that before we get to that level, there's a lot of layers of things we need to think about um, that will actually make it much, much easier for us to offset that uh, carbon footprint when we get to that building. For instance, uh, if you think about that process earlier, you're like, okay, well, we're developing in this particular area. What skills exist? What materials exist? What can we source from this community that will help us achieve that footprint? Unfortunately, when you do that, at the end of your project, you find that LEED certification manual does not include that particular thing that is made in um, 
the, 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 uh, that particular recyclable material that is made in, 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 uh, in, uh, in the slums in Lagos. Because we don't, we don't invest in this. We don't invest in that. And therefore, also our metrics of measuring how we're doing on this is wrong. Yeah. Um, and so we, we, I, I, I sounded the alarm when we started this, this discussion and I didn't talk about what we are doing <laughs> to, 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 to address the problem. We've started a design school uh, in Kigali uh, as part of our program. And basically what you're trying to do in, the, in, the, in that design school, uh, we, we call uh, the African Design Center, is to find ways first to uh, not let people go to China to study architecture, because that's plain cruel. Uh, and, two, <laughs> and two, also uh, in encourage young architects and designers to understand that, 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 that we don't lack technical capabilities to, to achieve these things. Uh, if we're talking about climate change, um, the current discussion of measuring how much you offset uh, in, in, in our intervention it's easily to be done, but can we do it? Are we going to be able to do it? Uh, are, we, are we resilient enough to, 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 to force that agenda to happen, uh, even in difficult conditions that uh, sometimes are embedded in, in legal frameworks that we work in, uh, uh, that embedded in, uh, in complex societal and socioeconomic uh, conditions we work in? Are we able to to be clever enough, to be creative enough to get those solutions across. I think that's the, that's the, main, the main thing. I think I would say that in the last, inherently I think everybody wants to do good for, for the environment, for every, uh, uh, all of us, but we give up somewhere in the middle. And yeah, that, so, that's what so, I want so to figure question. out. So you know, looking at buildings, uh, their climate mitigation, uh, their ability to reduce uh, carbon emissions, but thinking about that, okay, in a system of right. a city, right. you know, a, a wider system. So, um, uh, and some of the challenges with LEED certification or, or certification systems developed in, uh, you know, countries like the US and trying to apply that in Africa. Yeah. But, 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 exactly. but I just wonder, But I wanted yeah. to add one last thing, one yeah. last thing. To answer her question um, simply is, yes, it is a very serious problem, but again, it's a problem we created that, if we change our, our practices and our processes, we might not have to deal with that in the first place. Yeah. I think that's, that's our take into, into the thing. Great. And I'd, like, I'd actually like to pivot away from uh, this notion of climate change um, and the almost exclusive focus on the built environment. Um, but we like to think that uh, when, whenever I hear uh, climate change and when we talk about resilience, um, the response typically is climate change, uh, sustainability. And what we like to say is that climate change represents another silo and another vertical. And if we continue to operate in these, in the, these siloed uh, frameworks, um, we will not be able to identify and source um, solutions that can provide multiple uh, benefits, multiple uh, resilience dividends, as we like to call them. Mm -hmm. So rather than looking at, at, at climate uh, change um, as, as an issue that needs to be uh, focused on and addressed uniquely, I think it's really important to look at the impact of climate change across all of the, the other challenges that many of our cities are, are facing, um, whether you're applying a gendered lens to that. We know that uh, when droughts and floods occur, that women and children and the poor are disproportionately impacted. Um, we, we, and, and I think we need to be thinking also about some of the social and some of the economic um, um, uh, uh, impacts and, and, and thinking more transversely and holistically. Yeah. Okay, so we shouldn't think about it in a siloed way. These are interconnected uh, issues. Great. Um, and, and Sheila, do you want to say something on climate uh, change? I just want to, to look at all the three issues that people raised from the lens of people living in informality. Yeah. Uh, if you look at a lot of the businesses that are there in informal settlements, they are absolutely the robust future link processes of recycling, mm -hmm. of uh, conservation, of uh, very, very less carbon print, which is negative, mm -hmm. but which can be used. And, and a lot of uh, these people, because they are in the informal sector, are actually uh, 
made to feel everything that they do is illegal. Mm. So in many municipalities, scavenging for separating paper, plastic and biodegradable stuff is illegal. It's like going to a post box and trying to take something that's inside the post box. It's illegal. So many of our federations have to fight to say, let the municipality work with networks of scavengers to produce healthy, safe, and viable businesses of recycling because the other problem is our dumps are getting and intruding more and more on the rural landscape. Uh, we're finding lots of pe young people who now have smartphones using this networking capacity wherever they have, at least in India and many countries in Asia, it's much cheaper than other places, to use it to, to find connections to offices who now say, okay, you can come every week and take all the waste paper from us. Or you can come and do all the services and things like that. But all this is still very, very uh, in the gray area as far as legal frameworks are concerned. Cities and city planning, for instance, gives no space for people to separate stuff. It's illegal to do it on the pavement. And the last and most important thing is that most of the cities at least the elite in the cities are using disproportionate water and they're creating almost a, a crisis in localities in the rural landscape where the people from where you're getting water are not getting water while it's all being piped into cities. So there are all these inequalities that are getting multiplied because everybody's treating all this in silos and dealing with the environment and dealing with climate change is only seen with a perspective of only some specific things and not in a holistic manner. Fantastic. So climate change, um, uh, we had a question about best practice and connectivity. Just, you know, uh, any thoughts from our panel um, on connectivity? Yeah, I can talk about that. I think, yes, so that's where um, we, we saw the biggest opportunity. Uh, I think like um, advancement in technology is a great thing, it's a great tool. Uh, the mistake we, we often think about in our circles of, of work is to think that they're going to solve our problems instantly. Um, and, and basically when we're shaping this program, the, the, we were thinking about, about um, this, this large mass of population we have that uh, has no access to this technology or can have limited access to this technology and the existence itself of this technology that is able to be accessed by anyone who came from uh, 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 remote places. Um, and then we, we see on the African continent, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, to be speaking in the sub-Saharan Africa context particularly because that's where I work most, most of my time, um, there is a need to create this, this um, uh, facilitating group uh, that is able to connect uh, uh, both opportunities from, from, from those ends and produce uh, solutions that are actually working for everybody. So we were talking about, I, I, and I was struck about how young people, I mean, I'm, uh, now I'm not consider, I don't consider myself young anymore. Um, but I, I was give, the, giving this lecture at a university at a, uh, University of, of Architecture in Tanzania, and this young man asked me a question. And he's like, "Well, um, in this era where everyone has a smartphone, how do you see uh, how we can use architecture, uh, uh, taking advantage of 3D printing and, and all these things?" Then I asked him, "Like, where do you, where do you come from in Tanzania?" He said, "I come from I don't know which area." Uh, do you have uncles and aunts in that area? Is it, do you, you still have your grandmother? Like, do your grandmother have a cell phone? Like, no. Well, do your uncle has a smartphone? Like, no. Then how can you assume that everybody has a smartphone? Already, your, the premise of your question is wrong. That means he, when he thinks about an architectural solution, he's like, oh, I can 3D print this tomorrow in China, and that's it. His, his job is done, right? But, but we, we, we're telling them, like, look, guys, we know you have an access to a smartphone, which is a great thing. You know a 3D printer exists, which is a great thing. But you need to use all that capability to understand a solution or something that your mother, your grandmother, or your uncle will need to use, but also profit from. Right? Like she's not useless. She's not, she should not be a recipient of 
that technology. She needs to contribute to that technology. And the output, the product, needs to be a combination of what she can do, or the knowledge she possesses, mm -hmm. with the capabilities of that great technology. That's your job, to facilitate that conversation to happen. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're trying to teach them. And, and I want to, to bring it, to tie that into a question uh, um, that lady asked about businesses. That's another big assumption that um, most people make that all those people that I just said are going to be part of this urban uh, population of Africa are people who are going to be sitting waiting for jobs. That's very wrong. Because creativity is not something that you need to give a green light to happen. No. Like whether you, you give it green light or not, it's going to happen. And when you give it a red light, people get creative very fast in a negative way that it actually starts becoming very difficult for you to be creative in changing that. So we, 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 we believe in our, in our practice that if, you, if, we, if we're clever enough to, to, to give a platform or to give this, um, to create this environment where this creativity is harnessed and, and channeled in the right positive direction, we're able to amplify um, its capabilities now from informal settlements to recycling to reducing to all of these catch phrases that we use and be able to create solutions that are actually going to work. And once that happens, then we can let it function by itself as a system that is self-sustaining. But I've given this example. I've seen emails written by hackers, supposedly from Nigeria. I don't know where they come from. <laughs> that are so well written than most emails I've seen from government employees from our own country. And that's true. Because these people are educated, they probably don't know anything about finances or financial systems, but they will understand like, oh, if I say uh, this banking system in Switzerland is the one facilitating this transaction, I'm more likely to be trusted. And they understand this. While you, when you do a legitimate job for the government and you give them a, your bank account in, I don't know, in Nigeria, they'll take 10 months to pay you. They're like, we don't know, why don't you give us a local bank account? Like, it's a bank account, just pay me, you know? So that, 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 that contrast is something that I, we feel, at least I personally, I feel like we don't really appreciate how, how uh, the, the, the sensitivity of that balance. Because once we let it tip, it takes us 10 times energy to tip it back. So thanks, this, yeah. this concept of um, the in so the internet is knowledge. Knowledge is power. Um, I think I don't really buy into that. Um, I think that there are many um, organic, sort of homegrown um, methods of transferring knowledge um, in Africa, especially um, that are now taking the back seat because. Many of our young people think that, you know, I can get on the internet and I can find a solution in China um, that I can apply within the African context. But whether you're looking at the oral traditions of the griots of, of West Africa or even in, in, uh, in Rwanda, so uh, Umuganda is something that um, has been shared in Rwanda and has created this sense of, of cohesion in, in the nation. And what it is is that on the fourth Saturday of every, of every month, the city shuts down, the businesses shut down, the uh, taxi drivers uh, stop working, and um, individual homes and communities and, and cells down to the smallest unit um, are charged with uh, sending a representative uh, from the home that participates in building up the community. That is also a time that is used to transfer knowledge and to identify priorities within the community and to identify a means of implementing um, those priorities. And so I think that while we want to focus on, on high-speed internet and technology solutions, there are many other uh, modalities that in, in uh, low-resource environments could be more appropriate. So, Kigali is a very connected city, but if you go to a city like Accra, where you may not have electricity for, 20, for 22 hours out of a day, 
Um, and if you don't have electricity, how are you going to access the internet? Um, and, and so I think we need to continue to be open and we need to continue to be creative about ways of transferring knowledge and not necessarily focusing on modalities that work better or are better suited to um, highly resourced environments. Okay, thank you very much, Liz. <laughs> Any responses from the audience on, on that climate change, connectivity, or the role of business? And anyone got anything they'd like to, to share? Matt, Matt uh, Thank you very much. Very interesting conversation. Sorry. Oh, yes. Oh, interesting conversation. I hear more kind of uh, reflections to the challenges of today. There are many challenges, but going back to the climate debate or the the mega trends, there are some big trends that we know of. Uh, cities will probably be 80% of the population and the population will be increasing. That means there's a, probably a doubling of the cities by 2050. At the same time, it's not just climate change, but if we want to follow Paris globally, that's not a, globally we should be out of using fossil fuel. So we have to have cities that operate without using fossil fuels in a time where they will be doubling. And a big part of those cities will be informal as well, because it's probably more lowest income populations that will go into these cities. So, so I wonder, I mean, it's important to understand how to react to the challenges of today, no doubt. But still, as we build infrastructure, we build essentially the way we may be able to live in the future. And so I wonder if you translate that into particular design principles that you say, what, what kind of principles do you keep in mind to kind of get yourself on the right track and keep that as the context? And so, 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 so yes, we have to resolve issues of today, but also kind of build the track to have a chance uh, in the future to be effective. So what would be these design principles that you kind of your mantras that you bring into the world. Thank you. Yeah, so um, Mattis, actually, I, I would like you, whether you have any mantras you would like uh, the panelists to think about from your, for, from your expertise, you know, and then we can see whether, uh, uh, or, or are you just, are, are you posing problems and not uh, creating solutions? I'm always posing problems, no. <laughs> I mean, there are interesting perspectives. I mean, you, you, work, you work from a set of principles, 10 principles yeah. about one planet living, or it's, but yeah. it, maybe they're not, the ones that resonate, I, I don't know. I mean, just generally, I think, if we thought about th city infrastructure more as wealth, and to think a little bit harder about what kind of investments truly build our wealth, which means our ability to generate income. Uh, so for example, we continue to, to expand airports or to expand car infrastructure, which are extremely expensive and very attractive because they seem to kind of generate economic income, but in the end, make the city poorer and less resilient. So I think there's some core principles that then very strongly discern what kind of infrastructure we would, be, we, we would prefer, and we would probably not expand any motorized infrastructure anymore. So, so, right. so, so, so these are the kind of type of principles that are kind of thinking about infrastructure as wealth and ask every day, are we adding to the wealth or are we subtracting? So I think the, the first thing uh, that I'm really excited about is around this concept of multiple benefits and uh, the resilience dividend. So whether you're going to uh, build, uh, invest in infrastructure, if you're creating more roads, you should be creating roads that do more than just um, connect point A to point B. They should be roads that also have sidewalks, which can, can uh, encourage um, a pedestrian, um, a, a, uh, pedestrian mobility. They should be they should be roads that have bike lanes um, that can encourage um, bike bicycles as a mode of transportation. Um, in Kigali, one of the uh, the things that they recently did um, is they have new uh, uh, they have um, policy that states that every new road construction must have um, sidewalks and also um, bike lanes um, to do just that. So it's thinking about whether um, you're uh, building uh, uh, multiple family uh, dwellings, having rooftop gardens so that you can address some of the energy demand um, of those buildings. You can also provide uh, an epicenter for communities to congregate. So I think Primarily, it's this concept of multiple benefits and the resilience dividend. The second 
um, is really about rejecting uh, the notion of informality as an inherent negative and really starting to embrace some of the um, creativity and innovation that emanates from informality and how we address informal communities. Um, so in the city of Cape Town in Durban most recently, one of our partners, uh, which is uh, what three words, um, is a technological solution. Um, they have um, mapped the world on a three meter by three meter uh, grid and each uh, point um, has a three word address. So in cities where you don't have conventional uh, naming uh, 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 nomenclature, um, individuals who typically have lived in uh, informal settlements have been denied the dignity of having a, a, a home and an address. And therefore they cannot access things like opening a bank account, registering a birth, or even receiving um, life uh, uh, life uh, saving um, care uh, when it's needed. And so doing something like that, embracing both a conventional naming uh, system for, for streets and also acknowledging that informality is inherent to our communities. And, and what we need to focus on is ensuring that we can meet the basic needs of these communities and, and, and work not so much to create formal communities out of informal, but think about how we integrate them into our planning um, processes. I think that those are really the two things that um, keep me excited about this work um, and keep me hopeful about um, our ability to do good and to make this world uh, uh, and our cities uh, better for all. Thanks, Liz. So, <coughs> question up there. Uh, David Friedman um, with Build Change. Um, I'm an earthquake engineer from San Francisco. So uh, for me, uh, fault lines are literal and not figurative. Um, uh, but I chase, have had a career chasing earthquakes around the world. And if I've learned anything, it's, it's always the most disenfranchised communities that get hit the hardest, the informal communities, the communities where um, where building codes and building officials just don't get out to. And so um, I've begun to think more and more about thinking about less about city resilience and more about regional resilience. Uh, and just, uh, and if I think about the Bay Area, um, it, what we have 300 uh, resilient cities in, in the Bay Area. I'm not worried about San Francisco. I'm not worried about Oakland. I'm not worried about Berkeley. I'm worried about Richmond uh, and um, East Palo Alto and our poorest, most disenfranchised communities that are also vulnerable to sea level rise and vulnerable to earthquakes and vulnerable, their food <laughs> deserts, public transportation doesn't get there. So uh, um, I like this idea of thinking about the informal communities because they are the ones that are disenfranchised. And we have to, if we're gonna have more uh, s resilient communities, and more resilient regions, we gotta take care of those communities. And, and do you have uh, ideas no, of, from your experience of how to do that? Okay, okay, yeah, so, so okay, well, we, we have a big response here from our panel, so, okay. Sheila, yes. Yeah. So, uh, I just want to, before I take your question, to say that in the earlier question, I think a lot of what you're saying is a combination of looking at what works, but also doing leapfrogging. So in a, in a lot of informal settlements, if you actually go using the existing formal construction material, you'll never do it within the one and a half percent. So the question is, what is the world going to do with building materials? Who's going to invest in developing new norms and standards? and building designs that are going to be useful in the future. So there is no investment that is serious enough to explore this. Mm. These are not seen as investments. Mm. So I think that's a big area in which there has to be general advocacy and participation of different people to produce that. Uh, going to in, uh, earthquakes, uh, one of the things that we do as STI is we find that, like you say, that whether it's the tsunamis that happened or the earthquakes uh, or landslides, poor people cannot 
produce documentation that allows them to access whatever aid comes in. So we now have a special task force that actually rushes to those areas. And while people are still uh, coping with that, and agencies are coming to give them food and things, they sit with them and they document that, and they force the city to acknowledge that these people have the same claim to this as the first response. And we're trying to get large organizations uh, like uh, Red Cross and the, the, all the relief agencies to accommodate this strategy, because in the last tsunami in Asia, all the informal settlements, 80% did not get international assistance. A lot of the money was returned simply because you could not get a formal documentation mm. for this. So that was one, in, in, in our countries, that's a big crisis. And do you have any direct advice for the Bay Area of San Francisco? No, but I have for other, there are many other fault lines in the world, <laughs> including my country in yeah, India. Yeah, yeah. But, but I think that, that in many of the cases, this crisis we face is that the construction industry in those countries hasn't experienced earthquakes or landslides mm -hmm. for the last five, six hundred years. So there is no history mm -hmm. of learning how to do that. And we feel that in the operational code of assistance, this is the first thing that has to do, is that you start training masons and community people to understand what they need to do in retrofitting. They don't understand yeah. this. Thank you. So and, and that's a good segue to, uh, yeah. if you allow me to, to say exactly why I'm doing what I'm doing. Because, um, like, like she said, the lack of investment in that type of intervention, in the type of people who are actually to think that way, is the biggest problem. And, 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 and this, mo um, this unique way of thinking of what a city is, is the one destroying all these efforts. Uh, our, 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 basically, our fear of change, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to use that, 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 that expression, I don't know if it's going to fit, but we, we strongly believe that, that uh, if there is a group of people uh, large enough uh, to understand the nuances of all of these things, who are able to question what's uh, the safety in a city is. Kigali sits uh, right uh, on top of the Rifti Valley. Uh, earthquake is, is a threat. That I'm actually happy to meet an engineer who understands that. Because I've had conversations with engineers in my own country who say, no, I don't care. Don't, don't even talk about earthquake. And I'm like, you're an engineer. I'm an architect. You're supposed to be the one telling me these things. And, 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 and the same way about uh, economies and, and informal settlements, you're talking about uh, how now globally people are talking about um, how the urban life is changing, where the sharing economy is becoming a thing. Uh, no one wants to own an apartment anymore because it's supposed to be a financial burden, uh, rather than live in Airbnb and live in multiple cities. In a continent that is going to have uh, over 1.4 billion people under 25 years old in 20 years from now, I believe that sharing economy is going to be something relevant if our financial systems continue to be what they are. Then should we then build millions and millions of affordable housing apartments if no one is going to buy them? I don't know. Um, if we say we're going to invest, in, uh, you, you give an example, in uh, motorized transportation infrastructure, roads, and there's this global talk about drones, and they, be, they might become a thing five years from now. We have flying drone taxis. Then should African cities that are looking to accommodate 800 million more people in the next 20, I don't know, 25 years, invest in a massive uh, road infrastructure? I, I'm not sure. Yeah. So is, thanks, and Chris. And, and Liz, I'm going to have to call it to a close now. <laughs> Look, there's going to be, uh, uh, I've been told to, to stop on time. I mean, fantastic conversations, uh, you, you know, and, and, and thanks for bringing up actually the pace of change and the difficulty of planning. I'm just going to take away that actually our decisions in planning are not neutral. You know, they're going to have impacts. And the fantastic opportunity we have it with uh, excluded or marginalized people to actually help us create the solutions, whether it's in the Bay Area of San Francisco or in, uh, um, uh, you, you know, or slum dwellers in Africa or, or, or India. So 
I just want you to help thank our panelists for their contributions and to thank yourselves for your contributions. <laughs>